Well, hello, um, and welcome to uh, our COVID-19 challenging session. Uh, this is the third of that series, and uh, this one is on the unequal impact uh, of COVID, the pandemic, on the labour market. And uh, we, the Money Macro and Finance Society, which I suppose I'm representing today, and the Resolution Foundation are, are really delighted to have been able to come together in this series, which so far has, uh, uh, has been extremely productive. Um, I am uh, Simon Price, and um, I'm uh, on the executive team of the Money Macro and Finance Society. Um, and I'm also um, a professor of finance at uh, Essex Business School. Um, so I don't have a huge contribution uh, to bring to this debate, and I'm looking forward to hearing what our speakers have got to tell us about it, because I'm not a labour economist, although, uh, in fact, I did start my career as a labour economist, um, but uh, I haven't been working on that for a long time. So I'm, I'm just chair. Before I introduce the speakers, let me say a little about uh, the background to this talk. Um, COVID-19, this pandemic, has uh, precipitated the largest fall in output in hundreds of years by some measures in the, in the UK anyway. Um, but it's also had a huge effect on all our working lives. And I think the thing is that uh, what makes this particularly interesting, if that's the word, is that uh, the ways in which the pandemic has affected our lives differs dramatically between different sectors and different individuals. In some areas, normal working has been practically impossible, whereas in others, it's been more of a shift in the way in which we work and, uh, and the things that we spend our money on as well. Um, so you need to think online shopping, commuting and working at home to get some flavour of what's been, what's been happening there. Now, it seems pretty clear that uh, some at least, possibly many of these changes will remain with us for a long time, um, even if ultimately some of them unwind. So, so what we're looking at at the moment is something quite different from the usual impact uh, of a recession on unemployment. It's not just a big thing uh, that's happening. It, it looks different at the moment. Uh, and one question is, how different is it? So today we've got two well-qualified speakers who are going to discuss what is and what might be happening in the labour market um, right now and what's been happening recently, but also looking ahead into the future. And first, I don't know what it looks like on your screen, but on my screen, uh, on my right, uh, we have uh, Sir Christopher Pissarides, um, who as everybody knows, is the 2010 Nobel Prize Laureate in Economics. And it, that, of course, was awarded to him uh, for his contribution to um, uh, his, uh, the work on how uh, labour market flows illuminate our view of unemployment and, uh, and was instrumental, really, I think, in, uh, in changing our view of the, of the labour market at that time. Um, he now holds the Regis Chair of Economics at the LSE and is co-chair of the Institute for the Future of Work. And he describes himself, and I'm reading here, as an, a macroeconomist who specialises in the economics of labour markets, economic growth and structural change, especially as they relate to obstacles of free market clearing. And, and what's nice about what's happening today, particularly nice, is that uh, he, in the last 10 years or so, he's worked a lot on the economic impl implications of automation and artificial intelligence, and he's going to bring that broader uh, perspective to bear on the subject today. So it's not just about COVID, it's about a constellation of things uh, that we're observing at the moment. Tara Sinclair uh, works in uh, economics and international affairs at George Washington University. And she's also a senior fellow at the, uh, at the Hiring Lab, which is the economic research team um, at uh, the job site, uh, Indeed. And uh, her research interests focus on modelling, explaining and forecasting labour market conditions, recessions and other macroeconomic developments around the world. Um, 
So she's got her hands deep into the data and has been thinking for a long time uh, about uh, structural change in labour markets and other issues. So you can imagine that uh, I'm delighted to have both of them here with us today. Um, well, we also, however, uh, want to engage with you, the audience. It's a bit strange, all this. I can't see you, although you can see me. I don't know how many there are out there, but we know that we've got several hundred people registered for this. Um, so what we ask you to do is to submit questions during the event, and then I will, uh, which people have already started to do, and um, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try and submit a, a selection of those to um, uh, Chris and Tara after they finish speaking. Um, and to liven things up a bit and to give you the feeling that you are engaging, um, we're, uh, we've set up a couple of survey polls, um, the first of which will pop onto your screens uh, after the speakers have finished discussing, in which we ask you some questions, which we ask you to respond to, uh, which we might then use to spark some discussion uh, from the speakers. And uh, we're going to wind up at 3.45. So first speaker is uh, Sir Chris Pissarides, and uh, I hand over to you now, Chris. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you, and I'm uh, very happy talking to you about these topics, as Simon mentioned automation and what it's doing to labor markets has been occupying me for a few years now. And um, what I will focus today are the challenges that uh, COVID-19 has brought onto um, this process of um, replacing uh, workers with machines, if you like, and then how the workers are transiting to other uh, jobs. I have um, slides to share with you which I'm going to put up on my screen now. They are just mainly uh, headings and subheadings so that um, you know where we're going. And um, I hope I get the, the correct uh, uh, set of slides up here and get rid of the screen showing everyone else. Uh, here we go. So it's challenges in the labor market. And um, I start off by describing what was happening uh, before COVID-19, the challenges we're facing at that time, and then how COVID-19 um, has um, changed those um, uh, challenges and whether it's made it better, worse, and what kind of government policy do we need? Now, the um, Biggest challenge, you won't be surprised that labor markets were facing before COVID-19, you know, if you like following the uh, great moderation as the monetary and finance economist for the benefit of our chairman, I should mention that, uh, what uh, labor markets were doing in the 90s. Uh, then automation comes along, along with fame in the shape of robotics, mainly manufacturing, and automation also connected to the introduction of computers in uh, all kinds of jobs, and more recently, artificial intelligence. Um, that was a new technology. It's been described uh, by some as uh, Industry 4.0, by others as the fourth industrial revolution. Mainly the World Economic Forum has been promoting that idea. So it is a big change. And uh, now, new technology, of course, it's always a challenge to labor markets. You know, the Luddites is the usual example, example that people give 200 years ago. Uh, but uh, somehow uh, labor markets cope. They welcome, in fact, new technology ultimately because living standards rise. The problem is that the rewards from these technologies are not evenly spread. Sometimes they benefit more manufacturing workers, sometimes certain professions and so on. And in response to that uneven um, shock, if you like, in uh, labor markets, there is a process of structural transformation, which involves mainly the mobility of labor from one sector of the uh, labor market to another, which restores uh, equilibrium. That process has been going on ever since uh, industrialization, the biggest uh, structural transformation, the one that involved the decline of uh, agriculture and the rise of uh, industry and urban employment. Now, is it different this time? 
with um, automation, not coded yet. Okay. Some people believe yes. That Daniel Saskin has been putting forward this idea. He's written a book that says this time is different. Uh, and the reason that many people believe that this time is indeed different is because they believe that robotics and artificial intelligence can potentially take away many more jobs than previous technology and innovations. I, I don't believe that's the case. Um, partly because we have short memories, you know, electrification, the internal combustion engine took away as many jobs as they are being taken over now, but no one complained about the electrification of our cities and uh, industry and so on, or about the arrival of the motor car as opposed to horse-drawn uh, vehicles. Um, but that's not the main issue. The main issue that I don't believe that is different is that I do believe there is human ingenuity in um, creating jobs in the service sector. And I do believe that the things, the services that those new jobs supply are ones that people enjoy buying. By the way, the first people who stated that, that I saw in print was, uh, was JFK, American president in the early 1960s when very, very similar issues about automation were being discussed then because the first um, robots were appearing. Um, now, having said that, there are very famous precedents to the idea that um, uh, this time is different because the jobs will be taken over. And who more famous than John Maynard Keynes, who in 1931 wrote that, um, that the industrialization that was coming with uh, electrification and uh, growth of manufacturing in the, uh, first, in the first two decades of the 20th century would indeed make a lot of difference and, no, and there won't be enough jobs um, for people to do. Now, of course, what Cain missed is, it, is exactly what I pointed out in the previous bullet point, that he missed the idea that there are services that would be created. But, and I mean, you can't really blame him for not having the foresight. Travel was completely unknown in his time. Hospitality was unknown other than some theaters. The cinema was only just beginning. TV had been discovered two or three years earlier, but he had no idea that uh, it would grow toward within so those new service sectors that attracted uh, the, the, the workers. Now, I do believe there is one thing that might be different this time, and this is that the workers who are losing their jobs to automation, who are mainly industry workers or workers doing uh, routine tasks in the service sector, will have to move a long way along the uh, characteristics of the job, if you like, the tasks of the, of, of, of the overall job that they're doing in order to find new employment. So if I would say, is there a challenge in this new um, industrial revolution that we're facing that might be different or that might be more severe, if you like, than previous ones? I would say the transitional workers, but that's the challenge that is different. Not that there will be no jobs, I never, believe that. Okay, what about COVID-19? Has it made a difference to this? In the short term, it's obviously made a difference. We have lockdowns, we have social distancing, we have GDP falling down by quite, quite a bit, but you know, don't, don't panic. I think we are somewhere where we were 20 years ago in GDP and 20 years, 20 years ago, we were by no means uh, starving um, from uh, too low output. Um, now, that's the, that's the short term. I'm more interested in the medium to long term. I'm more interested in what happens post-COVID when we're all vaccinated with all these wonderful vaccines coming on. And uh, COVID-19 is a memory like uh, the Spanish flu or something. You're not, not that distant. Um, now, in the long term, of course, there's a lot of uncertainty. When I say long term, I mean five years from now. Uh, I, think, I think things will be different. And that's what I'll focus on here. And there are two big COVID-induced shifts that I think will not reverse. The first one is that the dynamics of the structural transformation that I described before, which comes in response to new technology, 
have been changed completely by COVID and they're not going to go back to what they were a year ago. And secondly, work arrangements have changed uh, completely, not, not completely, but very, very substantially. And um, a very significant number of these new work arrangements will stay with us and you will have some very, very big implications for uh, the way we live and work. Now, the main COVID impacts on the economy, which are related to the two uh, shifts that I mentioned before, are listed here. We've switched to e-commerce substantially. That will stay. Um, we switched to remote working and less travel. That will stay. And that's the main, the biggest change in work arrangements. Uh, and e-commerce, of course, is a change in the structure of um, production. Um, We've switched back to uh, home production in the sense that uh, we're going out much less, we cook a lot more at home, we do a lot more cleaning at home because we don't want to risk coming into contact uh, with uh, cleanliness. We even do a lot more teaching at home, young children not going to school. That's home production, which had been marketized at a fairly rapid rate. Um, in the recent past, but that's been reversed. And of course, the increase of automation that I just mentioned, maybe I should have put that on top, actually. And there's also been an increased use of contract work as what's, um, what's rather kindly, I would say, known as contract workers, and it should be known, but it's also known as gig economy. Contract workers are workers that do a job uh, one off at a time, company hires them, uh, they do their work, they get paid, they are not employees of the company. Sometimes they're zero hour contracts, sometimes gig economy, sometimes casual work. But it's essentially the company has a contract with worker for a specific uh, job. Um, now, what, what, is, um, what is it doing to structure a change in response to those change, changes? Well, you know, since this is organized by the money, macro and finance uh, society and academic institution, I thought I would put it um, in simple academic terms, just think of structural change in very, very simple terms as an equation. It has job destruction on one side, on the left side, and job creation on the right side. In equilibrium, those two have to be the same. Otherwise, the number of jobs will be changing over time. And we're in a situation that um, the um, economy is in equilibrium, equal number of job creation and job destruction. If you want to know about numbers, those might be something like 20% or a little bit less during the year. Now, what's happening with, um, with COVID? Well, automation, automation causes the job destruction, of course, because we take on machines, uh, they replace the workers, the workers lose those jobs, think robots in manufacturing, for example or think of the office uh, help typists, typing pools, and uh, Microsoft uh, software. They've been replaced by those technologies. And that's on the left side of the equation. And the COVID automation is accelerating in order to reduce the reliance on human labor. Uh, job destruction rates are higher. So the item on the left side goes up to COVID because of COVID to automation. On the right side, you have the job creation that is taking place. And the job creation has been uh, almost entirely in, in net terms, at least in services for the last 30 years. Uh, and rather worryingly, and it's telling us where we are, it's been especially in services involved in person-to-person -person interaction. Hospitality industry, you know, restaurants, hotels, and so on, uh, travel, uh, health and care, of course, uh, or customer service. Um, think of uh, the financial sector, for example, people who used to do back office work or cashier work, uh, which has been automated. They've now come out of their uh, little cubby holes behind and they're now standing at the entrance to uh, bank branches, and as soon as you walk in, they shake your hand, they talk to you, before COVID at least. That's the creation of tasks that involve person-to-person -person services. Those have been badly affected by COVID. 
Um, some jobs, of course, are expanding in uh, COVID uh, specific ways with uh, masks and shields and so on, especially in health and care. Uh, some gig economy jobs are expanding, home deliveries, a lot of online activity, transportation, with all these Amazon vans moving around, delivering boxes. Um, but not enough. I haven't seen any estimates that says that jobs being created are replacing those being destroyed in the hospitality sector, for example. And therefore, there's an equilibrium here emerging. The job creation, which is the right side of the equation, is going down. The job destruction, which is the left side of the equation, is going up. And something has to bring those two uh, into equilibrium again post-COVID. Now, how is the adjustment to a new normal, if you like, taking place? Well, you have on the one hand job destruction. Should we try and stop it? And the answer is no, because um, Job destruction is a result of automation. We're not going to reverse automation uh, in order to restore equilibrium that way. You know, automation does uh, bring other requirements, you know, social policy, training, and so on, and I'm going to mention some later on. But in terms of allowing it to take place, it, it, it's really just an acceleration of the old Joseph Schumpeter idea of creative destruction for productivity goes up, machines are more productive, and so on. Um, now, therefore, government, therefore, in the adjustment, what government and businesses and workers therefore should be would be on the job creation. How can we raise the job creation side, and how can we make sure that there are enough good jobs being created to um, employ the workers that um, are losing their jobs to the uh, accelerates automation. Now, of course, post-COVID, when we're all vaccinated, jobs involved in contact will return. But I, I believe in fewer numbers just because we got used to do e-commerce and uh, not avoiding too much interaction. Uh, contract work will probably increase even more in the future. But even if not, it will not going to go back to what it was before. So the challenge we are facing now, I, I call it the three problems, there are three aspects to it. The first one is how to create enough jobs to take on the workers losing their jobs. The second is how to help more workers transition from sectors getting automated to us creating the jobs. So the first one is about the quantity of jobs being created. The second point is about the transition of workers into the new jobs. And the final one is how to make sure that uh, that that the contract employment, the gig jobs, are proper jobs, not jobs that involve a lot of insecurities. So a little bit more of that later on. Now, given um, what I just described, this is a little bit repetitive, but not too repetitive, I hope this slide. It was likely to stay post-COVID. As I just mentioned, e-commerce is likely to stay. Home deliveries and all that will remain. You know, it's once you get used to um, shopping online, you realize how convenient sometimes it is, with, especially with heavy items. It gives you more choice and so on. I just uh, wish there was more competition uh, online um, uh, options we have, rather than what's effectively now one huge monopoly with competition taking place within that, mon within that monopoly uh, platform, rather than different ones around, but anyway. Um, automation will not reverse, as I mentioned. Remote, work, remote working will remain, I believe, and I have some evidence to show you, in fact, about that. And um, there is going to be less business travel because a lot of companies have got used to um, using Zoom. It's a lot cheaper. So I'm not promoting any particular software to be using internet meeting software. It could be Microsoft uh, Teams or various other ones that I've used in the last few months. Um, the more home production that I mentioned before and the less fewer, I should say, leisure activities such as tourist travel, I, th I think that will reverse. I can't um, imagine the hospitality industry uh, disappearing. Uh, recall that um, as living standards rise, we're taking more and more leisure. 
aging populations, activity more leisure, we are going to have more leisure time. We have to find, we have to have something interesting to do with that leisure time. We cannot just spend it all sitting in front of the television on our own in our living rooms just in case we come into contact with someone else. So I'm not going to say much about the, I think the marketization process is going to come back. I'm not going to say much about that particular process. Now, what's the role of government here? Well, in terms of uh, sectors of job creation, the biggest one is going to be health and care, partly because we've become so much more aware of health and care issues. And we realize how important they are, including public health, partly because of aging population and partly because Health and care have been traditionally a luxury good in the sense that a 10% increase in, um, in income usually brings about a 12% increase in spending on health and care. It might, it might, be, it might be more actually, I'm not sure I'm interpreting it under correctly, but, they, but the, the growth, and let me put it the way it's in the data, the growth in health and spending, sorry, the growth in health and care spending in an economy grows by two percentage points more than the growth in GDP. That's the sense in which it's a luxury good. And therefore, that's going to grow even more. Um, in terms of skills, the most valuable skills, especially outside health and care, in fact, health and care, the biggest skill is you know how to look after people um, because of, well, no, well, because of age or uh, sickness or childcare. In terms of skills, the most valuable ones are STEM. Um, now, the, um, the fact that in many countries, especially in the UK, but in many other countries too, in most other countries, not all, <laughs> too, uh, health and care are largely in the hands of government is a concern that will involve increased spending on um, job creation uh, over and above the growth in GDP. And the question is, how is it going to be funded? We can't um, expect to see governments choosing a tax revenue to grow faster than GDP. Um, STEM skills are also in the hands of um, government to a large extent, the acquisition, because government is in charge of the schooling of most people in society. And in fact, the UK, despite many things that you have, might be hearing in this uh, last few months of extreme nationalism being shown, uh, in the UK, the UK is not is not well positioned for STEM skills. Don't don't believe what you hear from politicians. They have other motives in in mind. Uh, specialization in school is it comes too early. Age sixteen. Age sixteen, you can give up learning anything that has to do with numbers, maths, science, or anything at all. And this is not how you acquire STEM skills. That's a different story that I'm beginning to feel more and more passionate about, especially when I hear our um, secretaries of state talking that way about this wonderful country and its wonderful skills. Um, now, what about transitions, training and uh, schemes, systems and companies role? Transition will require extensive training and life and learning. Post-COVID, these transitions will be mostly with these similar jobs, as I mentioned before, the challenge is the difficulty of transition. Um, government, again, needs to select training programs to subsidize because it's important to subsidize training programs. So it's important that they're done in the private sector um, on the job. And to succeed, also workers need to own that training in the sense that they are doing it because they believe that it will really be good for them and not uh, just something they're forced to do. And that is a challenge again. What about contract work and the quality of jobs? Well, gig jobs offer no sick leave, no holiday pay, no pensions, no training, no promotion prospects. It's just a contract, you know, come and do this job for me. That job might just be driving you from point A to point B and then forget about me. Um, now, it is the case, I've seen some recent uh, surveys actually in there, uh, data, although they haven't been published yet, so I don't want to say what they are, that most people who work in these jobs consider them either as temporary or as top up to regular jobs that they might have. You know, for example, most Uber drivers do it to top up their, their regular taxi income. I put in brackets tongue in cheek that every time I use an Uber, I ask them what they're doing and they always tell me that. But of course, that's not my only source of data. 
I haven't um, sunk that low in using data. Um, it's difficult to see how government can regulate these and how to deal with it. I put moonlighting in, um, in quotation marks because I haven't seen the term being used for, very, for a very, very long time. I don't know if it's still a term that people understand or if it's of being replaced by something else, but essentially, I mean, if there's, if there's second jobs, it's difficult to see how government can regulate them and um, make sure that uh, it's creating good jobs uh, in that sector. Okay, now that's the structural change that I wanted to talk about. Now let's uh, switch to um, work arrangements. I have no time, how much time. I have no idea how much time I have, although I'm timing myself here. I here, my clock is saying five minutes. Okay, now work arrangements pre dawn what were they? Urban employment has been mostly unchanged for many years, and that's what we've had. Uh, we work in an office or a shop, we travel to work from our home, some changes taking place there was I mean, online activities were growing. Mr. Bezos was extremely wealthy even before COVID. Uh, but if you look at the big picture of, uh, of things, they, they didn't really. I mean, a lot more people went to Oxford Street in London that sat in front of their computer and ordered from Amazon. Let's put it that way. Um, changes were minimal. Um, the big scale things. Um, now, the impact of COVID-19, and this, I should say, comes from a McKinsey Global Institute discussion paper that was published uh, last month. Uh, remote work is here to stay in these work arrangements. About a fifth of work activities can be done at home, and people want to do them, want to do it at home. The, new, the typical new type of job after this would be a hybrid one. It's not that one fifth of workers will always work from home, and the four fifths will continue going to the shop. It's just that most of us will have two or three days a week at home. As academics, of course, we're privileged. We've had at least one day at home a week um, since um, even before the discovery of computers and the internet. But most other jobs will be doing it on a regular basis. Uh, the use of internet to communicate and take part in meet meetings will continue. And what that implies is that is the distinction between the commercial city center and the residential areas would be less sharp that, than what is being uh, so far. We'll be doing work in residential areas as well, uh, and much less work in commercial city centers. The labor market implications of that will be that there will be huge impact on urban real estate and the location of activities related to the use of space, which involves a lot of jobs because it's a labor intensive activity. Several jobs that support office work, you know, restaurants, quick restaurants for a quick sandwich or something at lunch, taxes to take you from one place to the other, uh, cleaning services, maintenance services, all those services were located in central London. Um, if now one fifth of those are going to come to residential areas in North and South London, you can imagine that all these jobs have to move away. That's, that's a big labor market challenge. And the demand for, for space in city centers is going down. We have data from uh, US big cities like New York and so on. And the demand in residential areas is going up. We know, you know, talk to any estate agent, they will tell you that the, the biggest demand we're observing currently is more space in especially outdoor space in residential areas. But there is a reason for that because people are working at home and they want to go out and get some fresh air. Um, vacancy rates in urban centers are rising sharply. And I don't know the rents and construction requires extensive knowledge of um, computer software, uh, internet exploration, virtual meeting software. So if you like, it's a necessary condition is that you have to be able to work from a computer. Um, but in addition, you need um, to um, be able to, have to, to, to use all those things that involve re remote work. Now, usually the, the jobs that are in that frame, they're the more highly paid jobs, they're professional services, finance, especially. In fact, finance is number one in fact, for commercial, for uh, remote work. 
And therefore, the concept of inequality that we have here related to the quality of work as well as earnings will increase because the, the I mean, here is a set of new arrangements. People like to work from home. They like to use the internet. And the jobs that serve them best are the ones that were already the most highly paid ones. And they're already the best jobs that people wanted to have. So expect an increase in inequality unless uh, we do something through government. Another big labor market challenge. So here is my last slide. Before COVID-19 arrived, labor markets were already facing big challenges related to the transition of workers, as I mentioned. Uh, COVID-19 has made this challenge worse, more difficult, more transitions are required in new types of jobs, new locations, requiring new skills, I should say. And government has a very big role to play in, arrange, in facilitating this transition to both social policy as well as targeted economic <laughs> policy. But also I believe companies, corporations um, have a big role to play here Big companies have been favorably affected relative to smaller ones by COVID that will continue. And they should really use technology for, uh, good in, for the good of their community. In other words, they should follow the stakeholder um, um, approach maximization rather than just uh, profit maximization uh, come what may. All right, thank you very much, uh, Simon and everybody else. I'm stopping here. Mm. I will stop sharing. It looks like uh, you're still, uh, there we are, great. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I, so I, I was I must first of all congratulate you on your timing because you said you were going to take 30 minutes and you took 30 minutes. So that's very impressive. Um, but uh, we'll leave the discussion. So already there's a large number of questions here which relate to uh, what you've been talking about. Um, but we'll leave that until later. So I'll hand over straight to Tara now. Tara, over to you. Great. Thank you, Simon. Um, Share my screen here. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for this awesome opportunity to be able to talk about these really important issues. Um, and of, of course, um, you know, I am always impressed to hear Chris's insights on, on these topics. And um, you know, from, from the outset, let me just emphasize that I completely agree with him about the issue of automation um, and both its importance uh, before COVID, during COVID, and after COVID, uh, and, and also that it is likely not uh, different th this time in terms of uh, how the labor markets are going to respond. Uh, but on this issue of inequality, um, things may be getting worse. Um, but let me start um, just by um, setting a little context for how different uh, this economic crisis is, uh, in particular, insights on the labor market. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, a, some Indeed data uh, to, to highlight this. Um, and I'll, I'll focus on, on the US since that's the perspective I'm coming from, but I've, I've got some global data uh, as well as some comparisons between the US and the UK. Let me get my slides to adjust. So I would say that in terms of this recession, this time is different. Um, and in large part because we've got a, a very novel cause to uh, our economic crisis, which is the virus. Um, and one thing I want to highlight here is that uh, you know, the, the International Monetary Fund came out pretty strongly initially uh, with calling this recession the lockdown recession. And they've really realized that they should back off of that because it's, it's really a step higher than that. It, whether there were lockdowns or there weren't, there was still voluntary social distancing. And so people's response to the virus, whether it comes from a government policy or whether it comes from individual choices for protecting their health, it, it's really because of the coronavirus that we're having this economic crisis. It's not due to a specific policy response to that uh, situation. Um, and so because of that, you know, it, 
in both policy and individual responses, this recession looks very, very different than previous recessions because we're responding to a health crisis. And so for instance, this is really, uh, from my perspective, probably the, the first really services recession that we've seen and particularly on a global scale. Um, and so of course that's going to affect a very different side of employment. We typically think of services as being more recession resilient and manufacturing sectors as being more at risk. Whereas here we're really seeing uh, the goods production it was hit as well, but services were hit much harder. Uh, and along with that, because we think of this virus, although you know, it's, it's persisted in, in the world longer than we had initially hoped, um, it, we still saw that a lot of the job losses were at least initially temporary. People expected to go back probably to their same employer uh, as, as much as possible. Um, but you know, as it, that, uh, the, the crisis has persisted, of course, we are seeing increases in uh, permanent unemployment uh, along with temporary detachments from work. And of course the big thing, and this connects into inequality uh, generally, but specifically COVID driven inequality is that we are really seeing these uh, different impacts on different sectors. Um, and so you're know, following in on Chris's point about e-commerce, right? We're seeing you know, areas like loading and stocking, which is an important uh, occupation within e-commerce, that group is seeing in, in improvements, right? So, so positive increases in job opportunities uh, over uh, the, the crisis period. Whereas lots of other sectors, um, you know, notably childcare, arts, entertainment, hospitality, and tourism, um, but even um, you know, banking and finance have seen uh, declines in job opportunities uh, in terms of online job postings. Uh, this is U.S. data, but we're seeing common uh, patterns uh, across the U.K., Canada, and other countries as well. And so one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about these sorts of sector hits is that uh, different sectors have a different demographic representation as well. And so these groups are also, so people employed in childcare, arts and entertainment, hospitality, and tourism um, are more likely to be female, are um, more likely to be young, are more likely uh, to be um, of minority races. And so if we think about you know, the, the groups that are being hit by these sector shifts, uh, we're, we're seeing inequality uh, coming about there um, as, as well as uh, through the other economic transformations that we've been seeing uh, regarding the, the roles of education and other long run trends. So one thing I want to point out here that I think is really interesting is that we are seeing different patterns in terms of uh, the types of jobs that are, are being hit, depending upon the policies. And so if we think about just comparing the US and the UK, um, in the US, what we saw is that basically, whether it was top third, middle third, or bottom third job opportunities, um, they all fell um, pretty much in line with each other. And then as we've seen a recovery, it's the top third of jobs that have been slow to recover. Whereas in the UK, we saw that the um, top third jobs fell less and have um, you know, recovered kind of on pace with the others. And this really does seem to have to do with the government policies in terms of preserving or letting go those jobs that were initially hit in the crisis. So in the, the US, um, there were lots of layoffs. In the UK, uh, you know, less, less so. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that also show up in the job opportunities um, as, as people are looking to, to shift in the labor market. Uh, another area where we're seeing some differences in terms of policy performance and uh, policy and responses is um, what's happening in the US in terms of uh, women and in particular mothers, uh, female parents uh, being really hit in terms of um, employment. And uh, you know, some of this is that women are getting hit hard more generally because the sectors are being that they're involved in uh, have been hit. But then um, because of childcare responsibilities 
are not um, you know, moving to other roles in the same way as men and people without children. Um, and so the, the she session that we talk about here in the US doesn't seem as big in, uh, in particular in the, the UK. However, if the IMF did some recent analysis um, where they showed that overall, um, looking at 22 different countries, taking indeed job posting data and connecting it to international labor market organization data, that um, jobs with low female representation saw less of a drop than jobs with high female representation. So this once again emphasizes this uh, particular inequality that is, is happening uh, in terms of, of job opportunities by gender. Uh, but so I want to connect back to um, what we might think is happening uh, in the longer run in, re in response to COVID. And, and the way that I really think about it in terms of the labor market is a lot of the things, particularly the things that are going to persist after COVID is over, is stuff that we were headed towards maybe five years, 10 years out. And we basically advanced it forward and brought the future forward uh, immediately within you know, a few months rather than a few years. And there's two areas that I would like to uh, briefly highlight. Uh, and one is around uh, flexible work and of course, in particular, remote work. And this is something that had been um, actually a trend that workers had been asking for for a long time. It, it's hard to see now uh, because there was such a big jump in searches for remote work um, as uh, you know, we entered into the COVID times. Um, but there was actually a pretty strong trend in terms of search for remote work uh, rising over the last several years. And this has actually been something that I've been watching for a long time, that this was actually something that workers were asking for. Um, and of course now employers are also asking for this. And, and so we've seen uh, a lot more remote work arrangements. But so really the question is, as we're bringing this, these opportunities forward, is are we gonna end up with the right mix of work that's going to suit workers well, that um, they're going to be able to uh, work from home when it's better for them to work from home and work from an office when it's better for them to work from an office? Or are we going to end up in another kind of log jam where we see that um, employers are still setting the terms of the remote work so it doesn't feel flexible for the perspective of the worker, but rather it's flexible from the perspective of the employer. And I think that's an important aspect to think about where um, policy issues might come into play. And then of course, um, you know, following on you know, Chris's excellent points about automation and employment, um, you know, I, I think it's, it is important to think about kind of the conversations we were having about automation uh, before uh, all, all of the, the current economic situation, as well as thinking longer term. Um, and I think it's just always important. This is something that um, you know, we're, I think economists are consistently pointing out is that you know, automation, it isn't just about displacing labor. It's also creating new demand for labor. And we often think about it being tech roles and STEM related roles, but also because it creates more uh, leisure time for people and more income, hopefully um, that results in creating labor intensive roles, uh, opportunities where we may want to have human contact. And I, I think even though we want less contact in the short run, I actually think we, we do still want um, a lot of human contact and perhaps uh, human contact might be something that is a luxury good um, and that more people will want in, in the longer run. Um, and then, of course, there's also all sorts of within occupation shifts where our tasks and what we're doing from day to day look very different, even if our job titles stay the same and even if our output stays similar in terms of the, the result of, of the work, the way that we do the work shifts as we get more automation. Um, and of course, there's been you know, recently a lot of innovation around the contactless provisions of goods and services. Um, and it, we might imagine um, that this uh, could slow down the economic recovery uh, because we might first have this displacement and then new job creation. You know, and that might uh, be consistent with um, this bringing forward the future idea. Um, but then there's also this countervailing force um, that weaker labor markets 
um, typically do you know, slow down the adoption of labor displacing technology because uh, you know, labor is, is cheaper and, and more readily available. Now, how much that applies in the, this weird COVID time um, where we are adopting new technologies quickly just to you know, enable us to be able to put any kind of output out there um, is, um, you know, I, th I think on that front this time is, is different as, as well as compared to a normal recession. So let me just conclude by pointing out that I'm really looking forward to a strong labor market in the future. I think we need a very strong labor market as quickly as possible in order to get us to a, a, a more equal, uh, strong economy in the long run. Um, so just to highlight a, a few key points, I think bargaining power really matters if we think about um, if we have a strong labor market, then the types of automation and the types of innovations we see will be ones that are, will be appealing to workers as compared to as to employer for employers. Um, I also want to emphasize that I think we need an adaptable workforce. You know, Chris really emphasized STEM, and I think that that's a, you know a, a key piece of it. Uh, and, but I would also just say that generally being able to learn new skills over time so that the workforce can adapt as new needs and new job types arise, I think is, is really important. So lifelong learning is, is really critical there. Um, and uh, you know, one thing that we learned particularly here in the US from the recovery of the Great Recession is that slow recoveries leave uh, lots of people behind and that if we can have a, a robust and strong economy, we can bring all sorts of groups into the labor market. And unfortunately, those same groups are the ones that have been hit by a lot of the COVID layoffs. Um, and so I think you know, specifically focusing on those groups um, to get them back into the labor market uh, is, is really critical as, as we look towards recovery. Um, and then just to connect back to the whole automation discussion, discussion, I think it's really important to remember that productivity gains are good and, and that um, we need productivity gains and employment gains. These, in, these innovations to make work better and faster is what um, you know, continues to improve our living standards. Uh, and so you know, I really wanna focus on growing the economic pie uh, as well as thinking about how we share that pie. And I'll stop there. Okay, great. Thanks, Tara. Um, I, I really want to throw the um, uh, uh, throw the audience into the debate by bringing in some of their questions uh, as soon as I can. But um, before I do that, briefly, uh, Chris, do you feel that there's anything you want to respond to immediately in in Tara's presentation? Uh, yeah, sure. I'm going to be quick because I would I would love to see what the, the audience um, thought and what questions they have in mind. I, I mean, I do agree with with the um, general message that uh, Tara is giving. Obviously, it's, it's similar to what I was doing, and it's a very thoughtful and based on uh, on data. I, I I do have one point actually that I have to say puzzled me um, a, a lot, which is the gender bias of um, of COVID. Um, and, and especially, you know, the, the rate of automation. Now, I've always um, thought, and, and I've seen a lot of uh, evidence related to what you presented, which is that it's uh, that COVID has been really been biased against women. You know, of course, both genders have suffered, but it, but women suffered more because of the uh, jobs, the social uh, interaction jobs that closed down. And and yet, it, uh, one of your um, one very important graphs here. It, it's it's not it's not quite showing that. I think it's I, I think it looks to me to be inconsistent in that when there are no kids present, then uh, you have the same number of decline for men and women. And, and in fact, it's even more than that because if the initial employment of men is more in number, the same percentage decline means that many more men are losing jo their jobs than women. I, I'm I'm I not be right about the, the the initial pool, but normally that's what you expect. And and the only decline that is bigger is the case where there are kids present, where presumably you don't want your kids to go to school or you don't want the strangers to come and look after your kids in your childcare. So one of the parents uh, 
takes time off work or, or give out work to, to do the uh, childcare at home. And, and you're showing that more women are doing it than more than men. That's not too surprising given what we see from time use surveys. Now, obviously gender distributions to jobs don't depend on the existence of kids. So how, how could it be in that case that the demand for labor for women has fallen by more uh, across the board than men, and yet, where there are no kids present, there seems to be the same impact on men and women. And when there are kids present, it's more women. I mean, is it something that's being brought on, for example, by families giving up one job, mainly the women and going there and, and staying at home to look after the kids? Or is it because um, the sectors or the particular jobs and, and they just happen. It, it just cannot be a coincidence that, uh, that the negative shock has hit jobs held only by women who have children. Right. No, that, so I, I would say this is a labor supply, not a labor demand story here, that it, it is about the, the relative shifts of these different groups. It has mm. been women that have shifted out of the, the labor force. So I think it's more about labor force participation well, than it is about the, the labor demand side. On, yeah, that, on, on that, that, that's, that. that's the impression you should get. But then, but then are we saying that the next picture you showed that showed the bigger decline in that is, is the result of labor supply changes rather than labor demand changes? No, so that's, a, yeah, so that one is a labor demand. So that the, the second graph, so the first graph is about the employment to population uh, rate. Um, mm. And whereas the second graph is, is job postings. Uh, and so, so the, the second graph really is about labor demand. Um, and it's, it's true whether we look at um, US alone, which would be consistent with the first graph, or that one is for 22 countries. Um, but it's just broadly mapping the um, job postings and their their gender representation. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that it's they're going. Those types of jobs are going to be picked up more by women in the future, right? Because some women may be choosing not to participate in the labor force because they're they're doing parenting. So there's so there's this internal shifting between labor supply and labor demand. So we may what we may end up seeing is that the we're, we're seeing a drop off in labor demand for roles that have been more dominated by women. Uh, but then it might be that even those roles that are there are being more likely to be taken up by men or by women who are not parents. That's the, well, that, the yeah, that, I mean, that's surprising thing. That's something I learned now that there is an overall fall in uh, job openings in roles traditionally taken by women. And then, and then underlying that there is a supply shift where yeah women with kids are leaving from all kinds of jobs and then women without kids are redistributing themselves into those with the suits. It's that, yeah, that, that's, that's interesting actually. And it's, I think it's a new fact as well, this interaction between supply and demand. Mm -hmm. well, let's try and bring the audience in now. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to release the first poll, um, which uh, we've only got 15 minutes left. So um, we're going to have to move uh, fast now, but um, <clears throat> the, the first poll question, uh, can we have that um, uh, given to us, please? Okay, so this is a pretty central question um, and uh, addresses, I think, a lot of these issues about um, <clears throat> uh, about job, job disruption and, and creation that, uh, that Chris was talking about. So look at that. And uh, if you want to vote for it, then please do, and we'll look at the results uh, uh, in a few minutes. And I see already 32 people have voted. But right, uh, questions. So lots of questions from the audience. So I think I'll start off directly with one of those, um, although it's a question that I wanted to ask. Um, and uh, anonymous, um, if I can find, yeah, here we are, this is the one. Um, so if I got this technology right, it should have been highlighted now. Um, no, that's the wrong one. Sorry, Anonymous. It's the wrong Anonymous. Um, the, uh, 
One of the problems of remote working is the lag that you get, which mm -hmm. sometimes create problems. But here's a question about, um, uh, about business travel. And um, Chris, uh, one, one uh, difference uh, between the kind of structural change that we've seen before is not just uh, the, the, the level of change that uh, we're going to require, um, but also the fact that, uh, that, that, that if what you say is true, for example, about more homeworking and uh, dramatic shifts in the way in which, uh, in which we operate, then not only are we going to need people to move from one sector to another and for some sectors to grow and others to fall, uh, but we're also going to need uh, a potentially massive increase in infrastructure, um, which, uh, and the example here from the audience was the, the, that we're going to have to rethink uh, the way in which we move people around, not from the outside uh, to the centre of cities, but perhaps to get across cities to areas which are now residential. Uh, we can also think of uh, the use, the, the purpose to which buildings are being put um, so if there's less high street shopping, those big department stores are going to have to do something else. So do you, th do you think that this is uh, an important factor in what's going to happen going forward? Um, so Chris, first. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a massive factor, actually. And, and, uh, and it's probably one of the most important that, that we're going to be left with five years from now, because I'm mean, just saying, let's, let's take the US number that they, is the only, I call this, the only country that we have data that says about a fifth of work will be done uh, at home. That means that rush hour traffic from residential areas into the center, you know, take London or any other big city, will go down by 25%, sorry, 20%. Um, that, 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 that's a big number. I mean, you know, it would be, it would be God given actually that if you travel in the rush hour and there is 20% uh, less crowded than usual, but it will affect it and, and it will affect the urban travel with, within the city center. At the same time, it would increase it outside. Now, currently all our uh, business travel is, is geared to uh, areas around the center, moving people in. Now, if I want to go from A, a to B, which are both in the periphery, how do I do it? I either do it by my own car driving, or I get a taxi or a ride sharing service, or something that I do it. And, and, and that's going to be a massive, a massive change. Yeah, I mean, we'll need entire new infrastructure. Now put onto that the, the environmental concerns and all that, which will move us more into electrification uh, of cars, you know, petrol stations closing down, uh, charge stations increasing. We still don't have a good store of, uh, of, of energy for cars, you know, we have to leave them there for two or three hours to charge. The way how many home, vast majority of homes don't have garages. Where, did it, where does electricity come from to charge? It, it, it will it, it, it entirely transform the the transportation landscape of the of, of the city. I, I do think that I do think this will be massive and uh, cities better start planning it. And I don't know if the best planning department are the city authorities, which are not very good at that. I know from my own local bar, I might go, God help us from having come and design the next phase of transportation and parking in the city. If you need an overall city plan, nothing against come and don't get me wrong, I pay my rates. Um, it's, uh, but, but it needs a more coordinated effort to uh, yeah. make it consistent across the city. Okay, thanks. Uh, Tara, have you got any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, so I, I still wonder because there has been so, so much, many you know, decades worth of investment in the sort of uh, internal transportation. You know, we, we're going to have to think about budgets you know, here in Washington, D.C. It's already become a, a big issue where they're talking about shutting down our metro on weekends. Uh, so, so there are big budget issues. But we also know that it takes it, a decade or so to build a new metro line. And we see a lot of development built around uh, the, the metro structure. So I do wonder if we might you know, continue to see the same sort of uh, commuting patterns, but the sh shifting 
who, who lives exactly where and, and what activities are done in different places. Maybe we'll see more entertainment happening in old uh, office buildings or, or things like that. I think we're more likely to repurpose buildings than we are to develop new transportation networks. Okay, um, thanks. Um, next, uh, I'd like to read something that addresses the poll, really. So could we have the results of the poll up? Okay, so opinion's pretty evenly split, but um, say 54% think that um, uh, post-pandemic shifts will lead to a rise in structural unemployment, although it's a pretty tight margin. Uh, thanks. So, Chris, my, my take on this is that uh, what you described is a world where there's job destruction and job creation happening simultaneously. And essentially, that means that while that's happening, while those both increase, um, there'll be a structural rise in unemployment, if I understand what you're saying. But it doesn't necessarily follow from that, that as the poll question asked, that in the long run, uh, the changes that emerge from uh, the pandemic will lead to a change in structural unemployment. Uh, in fact, you might even be able to visualize worlds in which it's easier uh, to reallocate resources um, if there's uh, less physical uh, capital involved. Uh, have you got any thoughts about that? Yes, I, 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 it's it's a question of uh, of how long it, it takes. I I don't think we're going to get uh, a new normal of higher structural uh, unemployment on a regular uh, basis in, in in a steady state. What what gives you unemployment in a steady state is the speed of adjustment of the economy. And I don't think the speed of adjustment will continue accelerating or being very high. Um, we're going to get back to uh, normal and, so, and, and the average levels will be determined by level of uh, unemployment compensation and generally the support that people have, the wealth of the community, the jobs that are available, the flexibility of the market, you know, those things that brought unemployment down from what it was in the 80s to what uh, it was just before COVID. Where it might make a difference is in the duration of adjustment to a new normal, where, you know, whereas before, maybe if it was a normal a recession, maybe it would have been two years, three years, maybe now it would be five years. But uh, come 2026, unemployment will be back to what it was just before. Let me tell you, so, so I, I would have definitely voted no in that question. <laughs> right. Th thinking of more six years ahead. But let me tell you that Keynes had exactly the same idea. Keynes would have voted yes, actually, in 1930. So those who voted yes should feel good that they are on the side of uh, a much greater economy than I, will, I am or I will ever be. <laughs> You're very modest. But, uh, uh, Tara, have you got anything to add to that? Well, I, So I would have voted no as well. And I, I do feel like this is one of those things that it, it always surprises me how much... Um, it, I, I, I really see it as we often envision that the economy is this fixed pie and that if we are able to automate more of the jobs, then uh, you know, obviously there's going to be less work for other people. And we miss all of the job creation that can come out of both the you know, new types of work that we can do with automation and just this general idea that we will come up with new things to you know, employ humans to do. Um, and, and I think that that's something that we, we do keep, it's a lesson we keep learning again and again. Uh, and, and I think it's something that, and particularly just empirically looking at our recovery in the US from the great recession, you know, we spent many years you know, arguing that, okay, maybe the unemployment rate is now 5%. Oh, no, wait, maybe it's now, maybe it's 4.5%. Okay, no, maybe it is 4%. Like we, we kept saying that like this, you know, we, we, we must have some higher structural unemployment and it kept coming down as the economy strengthened. Uh, and I, I hope that we're learning that lesson and that we um, don't expect very high unemployment and, and policies are um, supportive of the economy to recover quickly and, and robustly from this recession. Okay, thanks. Um, so I, I want to bring up another question from the audience, uh, which is quite specific, but uh, which do think there's a more general issue around it. So uh, Celia here from the audience, um, uh, is saying that there's going to be 
uh, a change in the demand for particular workers, and she says health and social care. Um, and um, so would it be the case that uh, they'd be seen to be more useful and what may not necessarily follow is that uh, they'd be rewarded more? So I, th I think this, this raises a question, which is that uh, another aspect to structural change is not just physically moving people from one sector of the economy to another and investing in different types of, um, of resource, uh, but also wages, um, uh, rewards uh, have something to say here. So where do you two see um, uh, the, the obvious reallocation of, um, of incentives coming? Uh, in this new post-pandemic uh, world? Well, in, in, in terms of um, value, I think that we're already seeing uh, an increase in the value they have, you know, the uh, uploading at eight o'clock every evening uh, here during the, in the first phase of COVID, people are appreciating much more everyone is saying wonderful things about them. There are uh, posters in the windows everywhere. And, 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 it, and it's right that it should be like that because that's going to be the most important. It has been the most important sector in the last few months, but it will continue to be the most important sector. The unfortunate thing is that in terms of higher pay, they, they, they depend on government and government can only pay them more by taxing people more. And when, and when it comes to taxation, unfortunately, the, the, the general electorate and sometimes even government ministers themselves, they don't see the connection between higher taxation and, uh, and, and what they need to pay the, the key workers. I, I, I think, in fact, it would be a huge improvement if they link the two up. Um, I, I think actually I might, might, I might be wrong. I, th I think I'm right though to say that the Chinese government of all people link those things. You know, they say this part of taxation you pay is going to go to education and people pay more willingly. But it's going, you know, if, if uh, all, all we get is to, is to get a tax bill that is you know, too high for, the, for most people and then then we go to hospital and we complain that we have to wait a long time to get served. So, so, so you get this contradiction, whereas if our taxes were split up and, and we got a tax bill that said this much money is going to go to hospitals, this much money to schools, this to defense or whatever, then, and then you increase the hospitals and say we're increasing only the hospital, you know, the key worker allocation, then, then it would be a lot better. But, you know, I mean, who, who, who better to show us the huge contradiction that, that the prime minister himself, when he came out of hospital in, when he got COVID in April, and, and he said, I owe my life and, and my well being to two wonderful workers, one from Portugal and the other from uh, um, Asia, I think it was the Philippines or Vietnam, one of these countries, and, and wonderful, and I owe them and, and you knew their names. Well, I wonder if he's going to do anything about immigration when he goes back, when he went back to 10 Downing Street. And he will tell his voters, you know, vote for more immigration from the European Union, for example, because I had this wonderful Portuguese person looking after me. You know, of course not. We think of, about paying more taxes, asking his uh, electorate to pay more taxes, to pay, to give more money to these workers because that's so important. That, that's it. I'm, I'm very, very mm -hmm. disillusioned about all this. I'm, I'm sad to hear that. But <laughs> Tarek, do you have any final words? Because we're going to have to uh, wind up now. Um, although yeah. I will say something about the next questions. I, I will just uh, add on with, with Chris's point that I, you know, when we're thinking about where we're headed in terms of care, uh, with the aging population in particular, you know, we are looking at needing a lot more healthcare workers. And so when we start seeing those those strong shortages, particularly if the other parts of the economy are strong and people are drawn into other jobs, then uh, you know, there, there will be additional pressure for, for wage hikes in, in, in those areas. But it is tricky when it's controlled uh, you know, by the government and, and other groups. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm really sorry to our audience that uh, we can't uh, look at more of your questions, um, but we have run out of time. So I'd like to do two things. I'd, I'd like to thank our speakers, uh, Chris Pissaridis and Tara Sinclair, very much for, uh, for what they've uh, uh, told us today. And uh, the second thing that I'd, I'd like to do is to um, flag that we've got two more sessions in this series. Um, there's one which uh, perhaps this audience might be particularly interested on, in on, uh, on Friday, which is on distribution. 
um, where Benjamin Mole and Claudia Sam are, uh, are, are talking about you know, the wider issues surrounding distribution and uh, I suppose also inequality uh, on Friday. That's set to be a good session. And secondly, uh, Ivor Crew um, is um, uh, headlining uh, a, a session uh, tomorrow on uh, the challenges of governance uh, that have been thrown up by the pandemic. And I believe that uh, Ivor is uh, not just going to talk about what's been happening over the last year, but talking about um, the uh, the changes in governance that, um, that led up to um, what uh, some people anyway think is uh, not the best possible response to the pandemic. So thank you. Thanks to my speakers and thanks to everybody who's been participating. And that's Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Bye bye, everybody. Bye, Tara.